Okay, so we're continuing on this uh, theme of oneness and how it's not biblical. <clears throat> the oneness doctrine, doctrine, also known as modalism, also known as Sabellianism, uh, teaches that God is not three persons, three eternal persons, and one God. It teaches one God and one person that manifests itself in different modes and different masks uh, at different times. But it's never more than one person. Okay? And so the Father is the Son, the Son is the Holy Spirit. That's what they would say. And they think they have proof texts for these things, and we'll discuss that more, Lord willing, next time I talk about this topic. Um, we'll probably do one more teaching besides today on uh, texts that show that they're wrong. Um, we'll see how today goes. And then probably a couple weeks, a week or two on their objections, the, the scriptures that they love to use to supposedly support their doctrine. We also saw last week that this doctrine is not historical. The early church did not believe it. There are writings against it. We even saw a quote from Cyprian in the 200s, where he basically quoted from 1 John 5, 7. It's the only part in the Bible where that, that language is found, and he basically quotes from it long before the Council of Nicaea, long before uh, the, you know, they say the King James and New King James are wrong in this, long before the text behind that were around. And so it's obvious that it was there from the beginning. And so, so from today and, and most likely tomorrow, we're going to, not tomorrow, next, next time we talk about this, we're going to look at different passages throughout the Bible. That could be real exhaustive. That, I, mean, I could go on this t- topic forever. There's so many scriptures. But the ones that I think are most important to focus on these things to show us what the Word of God says in this issue, how there is a plurality in God, how there is more than one person in God. So turn to Genesis chapter 1. We'll start there today. I'm going to go through some Old Testament verses, probably go through some more Old Testament next week, or the week after that, which are every time I teach next on this topic. And then we'll go to some New Testament passages today as well. So Genesis 1, verse 26 <clears throat> it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the ca- cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on earth. So this is day six. God is making man now. And whose image is man made in? God's image. Is man made in angel's image? Is God made in the image of fish? Birds? Okay, so when God says, let us make man in our image... What does us and our tell us? It tells us as a plurality. There's at least two people there, right? And it's talking about making. When do we ever see anywhere in Scripture where angels make something? That they create something? The word bara, which is the Hebrew word translated as created, means to create out of nothing. It's only used of God. And he says, let us make man in our image. And so he's obviously talking, not to himself. I mean, some oneness people would have you believe that this is talking about God talking to himself. Like, <laughs> if I were to start a new project tomorrow, let's say I finally put the swing set up. And I, I go out there and look at the project as a whole, and I got the bolts <laughs> and the nuts, and trying to figure out what part goes where. And I say, let me see. I didn't say, let us see, Right? I didn't say, let our see, let me see. So they would have you believe that that, that's equivalent to what God is doing here. Let me see. No, he says us. He says our, which is obviously plural. If if you come to me in normal conversation, use the word us and our, I'm going to assume you're talking about someone besides just you. You're talking about someone else besides you, including you in it. Because that's what it takes when you have a we and us or an ours, more than one persons. Okay, so from the beginning, we see a plurality in the Godhead. 
And then we see in Genesis 2.24. Now this is not talking about God, it's talking about man here, but it's, it's a very good point to make. It says, therefore a man shall leave his mother, it's talking about uh, this after God created Eve, out of Adam's side. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, and be joined to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Now me and my wife, have been one flesh for about 18 years now. Okay? Raise your hand if you see two people in this room. Raise your hand if you see one. Yeah, you see? But we're one flesh. So two persons can be one in some kind of way. And when it comes to me and my wife, if things are going right and they're in order like they should be, there's me being the leader, right? I'm the head, I'm leading her, I'm directing her. If I make some stupid mistake, it's on me, it's not on her. But I'm leading her, I'm directing her. There's not two heads, there's only one head. But she really does have a head, doesn't she? Right? Even though I'm the head, she does have a head. Uh, she has a will, and I have a will, but she must submit her will to my will. <coughs> Biblically speaking, she must submit her will to my will. That's the way it works in God's order, in God's design, in God's economy. She must submit to me. I am the leader. But I also must love her and serve her and lay my life down for her. That's the order God has placed. But that requires me to do that to her. That requires her to do that to me. But yet we're still one flesh. You see? And so God is one, even though there's three persons. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And all three persons throughout all of history have their roles and what they're supposed to do in the redemption plan of redeeming mankind from their sin, saving them and having a new kingdom someday where there's no sin at all. They all have their purpose. They all have their roles. It's like me and my wife had our role, and they're one. As we saw was that last week in John 17, I think it was last week in John 17, where we saw he prayed, Father, let them be one as we are one. You could, I mean, you could really, I mean, it doesn't say this in Scripture, but there's like some kind of oneness involved in the marriage that's similar to the oneness that's found in God. Just like there's oneness in the church, in the body of Christ, with one head and a body with lots of parts, lots of people. There's a oneness there, too. And it's very similar to the oneness that God the Father has with God the Son. Because He says, let them be one as we are one. And so we see the same thing here in marriage. So you see a oneness in marriage, you see a oneness in the church, but there's multiple people involved in both relationships. Church, how many people do we have? We have, a lot, we have more than one person here, right? And God wants us to be one. Just as Him and the Father are one. That's what Jesus says. Because He didn't just pray for His disciples He had then, He also prayed for those who would be His disciples later on. So there's a oneness. So that will kind of help us understand the kind of oneness the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have. Genesis 3, 22. <clears throat> After Adam and Eve sinned, kicked him out of the garden, then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, <coughs> to know good and evil. And now, as he put out his hand, and take also and eat of the tree of life, and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. Here we have that word us again. Come like one of us. So, if I have eight apples on a countertop, and I say, Delia, pick one of those apples, you're going to assume there's more than one apple, right? If we go out today and we, we play a game out in the yard, and we're picking teams, and Malachi's a captain and Matthew's a captain, and I say, Malachi, pick one of us. You're going to say, well, there must be more than one person to pick, right? He has to choose. And I say, Matthew, that's your turn. You pick one of us. And there's one person left, and the last person left is shame. He's the last person picked. And I'm not going to say, pick one of us now, am I? Because number one, I've been picked. And number two, there's only one person left. I wouldn't use that language. And so God doesn't, God doesn't work any differently. He uses a language we understand. He doesn't give us language to confuse us. To make us think there's more than one person in the Godhead and there's actually only one. 
That's confusion, and God is not the author of confusion. Turn to Psalm 110. Psalm 110. Now this passage, possibly, I mean, I don't have a count, but possibly this passage is referenced to New Testament more than any other passage in the Old Testament. Possibly. I don't have a count of other passages and how often they're, they're, but this is quoted over and over and over again in the New Testament. It's quoted in Matthew, it's quoted in Mark, it's quoted in Luke, it's quoted in Acts, it's quoted in Hebrews. So over and over again we see this passage quoted. So it must be pretty important if it keeps being referenced back to. And why would, why would this be quoted over and over again if it's going to bring confusion regarding the nature of God? Okay? Now, in the New King James Version, when you see L-O-R-D in all capitals, what that means is in the Hebrew we have the Tetragrammaton, which is the Y-H-W-H, which is Yahweh. That's how you pronounce it in English, is Yahweh. I, I don't know if the King James has that or not, that, that thing or not. does. Okay, so... The Lord, Yahweh, said to my Lord, my Adonai, my Master. This is David speaking now. So Yahweh said to my Lord, my Master. Now, at this point in time, David is king of Israel. Who's his Master? Who's his Lord? He doesn't have any Master or Lord on earth. So Yahweh said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Then who's this guy who's sitting at his right hand? Till I make your enemies... Your footstool. The Lord shall send the, the rod of your strength out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. So I was talking about the return of Jesus. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. In the beauties of holiness. From the womb of the morning. You have the dew of your youth. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. That Lord right there is lowercase L-O-R-D. It's capital L, but lowercase O-R-D. That's talking about Adonai again, master. He shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. That's talking about Jesus' wrath when he returns. Blood's on his garments. He shall judge among the nations. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall execute the heads of the many countries. He shall drink of the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he shall lift up the head. That's talking about Jesus. But who said all this to Jesus? Yahweh did. He's not talking to himself. And who comes back in flaming fire, taking vengeance on all those who don't know God? Jesus. He comes back. Okay, so he's the Lord. There's a conversation going here. The Lord is saying to my Lord. David recognizes a plurality within God. All the way back in the Old Testament. David is realizing this. He's recognizing this. And this is quoted. And you, you might even have, if you have a reference by it, you might be able to go to, to verse 1 and see all the references there are there in the New Testament. Lots of references there. It's quoted over and over and over again. Okay, Proverbs chapter 30. And verse 4. <clears throat> Who has ascended into heaven or descended? That's Jesus. Who has gathered the wind in his fist? Who has bound the waters in a garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name? If you know. See, he has a son. A specific son. Not a son like I'm a son. I'm a son of God. If you're a child of God, you're a son or a daughter of God. What is his son's name? See, I have a name. My name is Kerrigan. Adam has a name. His name is Adam. Elijah has a name. His name is Elijah. We don't have the same name. What is his name? Jesus. See, there's a father and there's a son. Isaiah 48. Verse 12. Listen to me, O Jacob, and Israel my called. I am he. I am the first. I am also the last. Ironically, Jesus calls himself that in Revelation, and so does the Father. He called himself that in Revelation. 
Indeed, my hand has laid the foundation of the earth, and my right hand has stretched out the heavens. When I call to them, they stand up together. All of you assemble yourselves and hear. Who among them has declared these things? The Lord loves him. He shall do his pleasure on Babylon. And his arm shall be against the Chaldeans. I, even I, have spoken. Yes, I have called him. It's the Lord speaking now. I have brought him, and his way will prosper. Come near to me, hear this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. From the time that it was, I was there. And now the Lord God and his spirit have sent me. So the Lord God, Yahweh, and his spirit, the Holy Spirit, sent this person who's being spoken of here. It's obviously speaking of Jesus. Daniel chapter 7. Talking about the end times, you'll find a lot of problems, oneness people have with end time stuff because it just destroys it. There's all kinds of false teachings that can be destroyed by a proper view of eschatology, the last things, the end times. It destroys open theism, it destroys, destroys preterism, it destroys pre trib theology, it destroys oneness. All this is destroyed by having a proper understanding of end times. Why it's so important. We can't just put off the side and say, well, that's a, that's a side issue. It's not really that important. We can just, you know, no, we have to believe the truth in these things. And when you look at end time stuff, people get all confused about what the Word of God says. Well, it's important to understand it. Don't just put it aside. Like when I was a new Christian, I read everything through like ten times in a row. Didn't understand anything of it. Because I didn't have a firm foundation in the Old Testament first to understand what is going on in Revelation. So don't give up. If you don't understand it yet, don't give up. Keep reading. Keep understanding. Keep asking God for help. Daniel 7, verse 13. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. That's Jesus, right? That's how Jesus is going to return, with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Those two hymns are two different hymns. Then to him, Jesus, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages to serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away. And his kingdom, the one which shall never be destroyed. So you have the Ancient of Days. If you want a description of the Ancient Days, we can go back to verse 9. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousand ministered to him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The courts were seated, and the books were opened. That's obviously God, the Father. But then this Son of Man is coming on the clouds of heaven, coming towards. The ancient days is sitting right here on a throne, and the Son of Man is coming on the clouds of heaven, and comes near before him. And it's giving to him a kingdom. So obviously two people being talked about here. Obviously. Zechariah chapter 2. Second to last book of the Old Testament. Right before Malachi. Zechariah 2. Verse 8. For thus says the Lord of hosts. So the Lord there is, is Yahweh. This is what Yahweh says. He sent me. So Yahweh is sending someone, this person who's talking. He sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. He's talking to Israel. For surely I will shake my hand against them, and they shall become spoil for their servants. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I am coming, and I will dwell in your midst, says the Lord. That's the return of Christ. Many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day. They shall become my people, and I will dwell in your midst. Then you will know the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. And the Lord will take possession of Judah as his inheritance in the Holy Land, and will again choose Jerusalem. Be silent, all flesh, before the Lord, for he is aroused from his holy habitation. 
So he sends Jesus to wipe out the enemies. That's like the Battle of Armageddon. They're surrounding Jerusalem. They're trying to wipe out the Jewish people. Trying to wipe out Christians too, all around the world. And Jesus sets his feet on the Mount of Olives, so that's enough. We read what's going to happen in a second. We read from Psalm 110. What's going to happen from Isaiah 48. And so the return of Christ, we see this language being used too, that he's being sent by the Lord of hosts. Okay, let's go to Matthew. Matthew chapter 3, verse 16. This is the baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist. Verse 16, When Jesus had been baptized, he came up immediately from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending on like a dove and alighting on him. Well, that's the Son and the Holy Spirit. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, whom I am well pleased. We've seen this before when we were through John. God speaking from heaven. Jesus is on the earth. It's Jesus throwing his voice up to heaven like a ventriloquist and, and speaking back down to himself. We've talked about this before, I think, but you know, I've watched ventriloquists before and, and they have a little puppet and they're usually really good. Their mouth isn't moving, but they're talking. And it actually seems like the puppet is talking. And one ventriloquist one time talked about how he was at a comedy place and a guy, in the, he was talking to a guy in the crowd. He was kind of like, you know, being mean to him, I guess you could say. He was just having fun, trying to have fun, but he was being mean to him. The guy got mad. Who did the guy get mad at? The puppet. He got mad at the puppet. Not the man talking, but the puppet. You see, that guy was so deceived and thinking the puppet was actually talking to him, he got mad at the puppet. But it's just one person. Right? Is that what we have with Jesus and the Father? When the Father's talking from heaven like a ventriloquist, trying to fool us? If, if, if they're trying to fool us into believing that, there's only, that there is actually only one person, and trying to trick us into believing there are two people, then I'm fooled. Because it seems to me there's two people that are there. And we have a third person. We have the Holy Spirit descending on him like a dove. Matthew chapter 10, verse 32. Now, we think of confession, we think maybe the Roman Catholic Church, where there's a wooden booth, two doors, one person goes in, the priest goes in, there's a little mesh screen between them, and they confess their sins to the person. Or if we think biblically, we think we we're confessing to God. You know, we're confessing to a different person than us. It's like the Roman Catholic Church confessing to a different person besides them. So with that in mind, let's read Matthew 10, verse 32. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Now, what is the, 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 the language being used here about confession? First is confession before men. I'm not confessing before myself in my room in front of a mirror. That's worthless. That's not even a confession. Okay? Confessing before men. You confess before man, like what happened yesterday. I was confessing before man yesterday. Brother Adam was confessing before man yesterday. Eric was confessing before man yesterday. That's what God is talking about. Confessing before men. That I will also confess before myself. Is that what you used to say? The language being these there of confession is confessing to other people. And if you do that, Jesus will confess to another person, the highest person, the Father. But if you don't confess before man, neither will he confess before the Father. You don't need to confess anything to yourself because you already know the truth about yourself. You already know uh, what's, what you need to confess. So you don't confess it to yourself. Confessing is revealing something to someone. It's admitting something to someone. And so we use the word confession here. It's obvious you can't change the, the, the way it's used with one part of these two verses and, change, and make it something different the other part of those two verses. The way confession works. Uh, Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20, verse 23. So John and James and their mother come to Jesus. Can I sit in your right and your left in the kingdom? And Jesus goes through the whole thing. And then in verse 23, he says, You will indeed drink my cup, 
and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But the sit on my right hand and my left is not mine to give, but it's for those to whom it is prepared by my Father. Now, if Jesus is the Father, how can he ever say that? How can he say it's not mine to give? He is the Father. It is his to give. <coughs> he should be able to answer that question. Yet no deceit was found in Jesus' mouth, the Bible says. Matthew 22, verse 41. We'll see here what we quoted from Psalm 110. Jesus using this very argument. 2241, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, The son of David. He said to them, How then does David, in the Spirit, call him Lord? And then he quotes, The Lord, this is Psalm, 10, uh, Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? David never called Absalom Lord. He never called Solomon Lord. He didn't call any of his descendants Lord. Except the one who pre-existed before becoming his descendant. The Lord Jesus Christ. And so Jesus is using this very argument. He's pointing to his deity. But he's also pointing to his sonship. He's a son of God, according, he's son, he's the son of God according to the Spirit, but he's also a son of David according to the flesh. He's human and God at the same time. Matthew 23, verse 9. And when Jesus is saying this, he's on earth, right? He's still on earth, right? Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, who is in, he who is in heaven. Well, if Jesus is the Father, why can't they just call him Father? He's on earth, right? Is he the Father? No, he's the Son. That's why they can't call him Father. And the Father is where? Not on earth. He's in heaven. Matthew 26, verse 39. Here we have Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And we're going to see the two wills, the will of the Father and the will of the Son coming out here. Verse 39. Jesus went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Not as I will, but as I will? Well, not as I will, but as you will. He says it again in verse 42. Again, a second time, he went away and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, this cup cannot pass away from me until, unless I drink it. Your will be done. Verse 44. So Jesus left them, went away again, and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Three times. He's not praying to himself. He's praying to somebody else. His Father. Matthew 27, verse 46. Jesus on the cross getting ready to die. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Does he forsake himself? Who is he talking to? Is he forsaking himself there? Or is he talking to someone else who's forsook him? And in what way has he forsaken him? Well, all throughout Jesus' life, people wanted to kill him. They wanted to stone him. They wanted to throw him off a cliff. They wanted to lay their hands on him. And God put a stop to it every time. The Father did. And now finally, He takes His hand of protection off His Son and allows Him to be crucified and suffer and bleed and die. And that's why He says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's not talking to Himself. Mark 13, verse 32. <clears throat> talking about the end times. Mark 13, verse 32. Jesus says about the day of his return, but of that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Now, if Jesus is the Father, how could he possibly say, I don't know, but I do know. I, I don't know, but I do know. 
Does that make any sense? If you were in school and your, your teacher said, what's 2 plus 2? And you said, well, I don't know, but I do know. They think you're crazy. They might discipline you in some way. They might give you some kind of wrong marking for that day in your class because you're playing games. Jesus isn't playing games. He's being for real here. But of that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Luke chapter 12. In verse 10. <clears throat> we'll start in verse 8. And also I say to you, whoever confesses me before men, him the Son of Man will also will confess before the angels of God. But he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But to him who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven. Now if the Holy Spirit is Jesus... And Jesus is the Holy Spirit. How can you be forgiven of things done to Jesus, but not of the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? See, there's a separation there. God's dealing with these two different sins in different ways. These sins committed against Jesus, they can be forgiven. This blasphemy, this unforgivable sin, this unpardonable sin, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, we're not going to talk about what that is. It's irrelevant at this point. The point is, how is that possible to only one person and one God? It's not possible. And can you sit, can, I mean, obviously, you, you can only sin against people, right? You can't sin against animals, I don't think. I mean, if you went outside, let's say you got really angry, your dog whipped your dog real hard, you shouldn't have whipped him so hard, you go out there and apologize to him, you're going to say, I forgive you. Is that what's going to happen? No, you say you ask, ask forgiveness to people, to humans, right? You, you sin against humans, you sin against people, you sin against God. And God is a person. We see Jesus here. You can be forgiven against the sins done to Jesus. But this, this one sin done against the Holy Spirit cannot be forgiven. It's impossible. But whatever, whatever you've done to Jesus, it can be forgiven. But this blasphemy against the Holy Spirit cannot be forgiven. So it shows there's a separation. There's a distinction there between the Son and the Holy Spirit. In Luke chapter 12, verse 10. Acts chapter 1. Verse 6. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked Jesus, the disciples, asking Jesus, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. Now, we just read about this second ago in Mark 13, 32. The day of Jesus' return, the angels do not know, nor does the Son, but only the Father. And one of the reasons Jesus can't give an answer here is because these are things the Father has put in his hands. He has no answer to give them. Being if he did, he wouldn't give it to them. It's not time for them to know. But he doesn't know. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So we have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in these three verses. We have Jesus being spoken to by the disciples. We have the Father revealing the seasons and times later on, which he has put in his own authority. We have Jesus talking about the Holy Spirit coming on the day of Pentecost, and the disciples being witnesses for Jesus in Jerusalem. Acts chapter 2, verse 32. We'll have the same passage, Psalm 110 again, quoted here. So we have David using Psalm 110. We have Jesus using Psalm 110. Now we have Peter using Psalm 110. Verse 32. This Jesus, God has raised up, which we are all witnesses. Therefore be exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he, he, himself, he says himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assured that God 
has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. So we have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in this passage as well. We have referring to Psalm 110 again in this passage. We have Jesus being raised up by the Father and receiving from the Father the promised Holy Spirit. That's someone different. And then he's poured out, as we see in the day of Pentecost. He's poured out upon the disciples. And then, of course, we have Psalm 110, verse 1 quoted again. And so God, the Father, has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Acts chapter 7, verse 56. We have Stephen here, full of the Holy Spirit, preaching to the Jewish leaders and people. And right before he dies, he sees heaven opened up and he sees something. What does he see? Well, verse 56. Look, I see the heavens open up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. So he sees God and he sees the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit. Maybe he just made a mistake here. Maybe he just seen things. You know, who knows? First Corinthians chapter eleven. First Corinthians chapter eleven. First Corinthians eleven is a good passage to look at for, for head coverings, for authority. Uh, verse three says, oftentimes it's pointed to for authority when it comes to man and wife or man and woman, but also good authority when it comes to the to God. It says, but I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of woman is man. The head of Christ is God. So the Father is the head of Christ. Remember we talked about earlier about the relationship between the church and Jesus and the church body itself is similar to the relationship between Jesus and the Father. Talked about the relationship with the, with the husband and wife is similar to the relationship between the Jesus, the Father, and uh, Jesus, the Son, and the Father. And how we, here we have it again. It's pointed out again. We're talking about marriage here. The head of woman is man. The head of man is Christ, because he's the head of the body of Christ. But the head of Christ is God the Father. 1 Corinthians 15. Once again, talking about the end of the days. Verse 24, 1 Corinthians 15, says this. <clears throat> Listen to this very carefully. Then comes the end. When he, talking about Jesus, he delivers the kingdom to God the Father. When he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he, Jesus, must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. For he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. So who is that talking about? Who is that, who's that the one thing that's not put under Jesus? Himself? The Father. The Father's not put the Father's above you. He's, he's, he is the head of Christ. Now when all things are made subject to Him, the Father, then the Son Himself will also be made, also be subject to Him, who put all things under Him, that God may be all in all. Now tell me how you understand those verses in a oneness mindset. It's literally impossible. So we see these things in end times. We saw a lot of end time scriptures today. And they, these things show um, how messed up modalism is. How unbiblical it is. This oneness teaching. And therefore we need to take heed to these scriptures and understand these things properly. And look at the rest of the scriptures in light of them. So it's a little, little shorter today, but I'm going to end there. If you have any questions, objections, or things you want to add, now is the time. How, I, I guess I, I don't necessarily have a... How, uh, it's like, how would you respond in evangelism to this? when we were talking about, what was that scripture where Jesus um, not knowing you know, the day or the hour, the day or the hour but yeah. the Father knowing yeah. to a person who denies the Trinity and Jesus is supposed to be God and all knowing which I know he has, he's a man and he's God yeah. in his dual nature mm -hmm. 
how would you explain that to somebody in the field? Like, as far as, well, they'll, they'll come up and say, well, Jesus is God, how can we know what he's returning? Yeah, well, if you look at it, Philippians, it talks about how the Son laid aside um, those right. s- certain things to to come into flesh and fulfill the purpose he had in life. So um, He's obviously not the Father. He's the Son. So there is a difference between the two. And it obviously points out, just from that one verse, Mark 13, 32, it makes it very clear there's a distinction between the two, two between the Father and the Son. There's no, no bones about it. Now, how we understand the Trinity is going to be different from us point, simply pointing out the Father's not the Son. And we see other scriptures where when we haven't focused on this in this in this uh, series because one that people believe Jesus is, is God, He is divine. Yeah. They have a misunderstanding of who He is, of course. They think He's the Father, but that's beside the point. Jesus, obviously, in many scriptures, shows Himself to be God. Right. Okay, so it's typically called the hypostatic union, where we have right. have the the deity and humanity come together. And so deity and humanity coming together is going to look different than deity by itself. It's <coughs> the Father, who's never been human. And so there's obviously a purpose and plan there. And um, how we understand the Trinity and how it actually works is different people understand it different ways. I have a teaching I did a long time ago. This is I did it back in North Carolina, so that would have been like 2008, I think, where I talk about this. How there's submission within the within the Trinity, that the Spirit submits to the Father and Son, the Son submits to the Father, and the Father is a source of everything. And in the early church, they gave two examples I thought were really good, because the Son's eternal and the Spirit's eternal. They didn't begin to exist at some point in time, but they flow from the Father. And so they gave the example of the Son. We have the orb of the Son, we have the flames that come from the Son, and we have the light that comes from the Son. Okay, the source of all that is the orb. But you can't. There's no separation between them. You you can't have one without the other. But yet they are distinct. You know, if I said I saw the flames of the sun, you wouldn't think I'm talking about the, the light rays of light, and you wouldn't think I'm talking about the orb. But the orb is the source of it all. And as soon as the orb began to exist, the flames and the light began to exist. And so, as long as the orb, the Father, has existed, which is eternity past, so has the Son, and so has the Spirit. They also give the example of uh, water. water. So we have a spring, and we have a creek and a river. And there's no, I mean, you go out here, I don't know how this creek outside my house starts. I don't know what, I mean, I've thought about going back to the source and see if it starts with a spring or whatever. There's no separating the spring from the creek, and then it flows into the Chattahoochee River. There's no separating those things. They're all one, but they are distinct. You wouldn't come out here and call that creek the river, and you wouldn't call the, the spring the creek. They're different things, but they're united together. And these are some of the examples they gave in the early church uh, with these things. So when it comes to... This this series is not really about necessarily understanding the Trinity and how everything works within it, how the economy works, but simply just refuting and rebutting and debunking the fact, the idea that there's only one person in the Godhead. And uh, Kevin also did a series on the Trinity that was really in-depth years ago, this is probably 2012 and that those teachings are online, it's called the Foundation of the Trinity, I think he has like three to five teachings on it, I can't remember how many and so you have my teaching on the Trinity is online, which is just one teaching, but it's a very general basic overview, but it helps you understand what, how the Trinity works and, th- and then you have cabinets that are more in depth talking about these things but I, I think e- even without going to the the understand Trinity, how, understanding how it works and how they interact between each other and what their roles are, before even going to that, it's obviously true from all these scriptures that oneness is false. Yeah. I don't have to give a positive rebuttal and explain my position to them to show them that their position, biblically speaking, is false. Yeah. You know? Like even like a, a theist, just a general theist, they can refute atheism. And not have to tell them what their God is like. Not tell them one thing about their God and what He's like. Have to, they can just refute atheism and show that it's false. Now, the atheists can ask questions and say, "Well, what is? How does it work?" The one this person who's currently deceived can ask me questions. Well, how does the Trinity work then? And I'll give them answers, but that doesn't defeat the fact that they're 
their theology, they put it aside and said, listen, if that's not it, let me find something else that is actually biblical and does actually work with all the scripture. Because you've got to get rid of stuff that's false. Anyway. So we'll see how the Lord leads me next week. Um, there's other scriptures I could bring out when it comes to showing one this is false from the, from the rest of the Bible. Um, I mean, Hebrews is really big in destroying this. So I might next week touch on that some more and then go into some of their, their problems. Actually, next week I'm probably going to teach on something different because it's Father's Day. So... But we get to that, I'll go back to go back to this and talk about this. There's probably two more teachings at least in this. So this this is this teaching is rising up, unfortunately, even especially among uh, open air preachers. Unfortunately, and so I know we have open air preachers in this fellowship. So we need to be beware of deception, and we need to be able to refute lies to help others get out of that deception. Amen.